So I'm Chetan. Uh, I'm, I'm CEO and uh, co-founder uh, at Acon Labs. Uh, so Acon uh, uh, is essentially uh, a DevOps uh, for IoT Edge. So we help people with uh, application orchestration and device management uh, for edge computing. Uh, so our analytics-based approach uh, help people to manage a large fleet of devices uh, with, uh, with, a, with, with a fairly uh, simplistic approach. That's what we do at Acon Labs. Awesome, awesome. Cool. Uh, let's start with Rachita again. Rachita, what is digital OH and why is it gaining significance? Why, why now is the time for digital OH or programmatic OH? So I think before we talk about digital out of home, right, like what I would like to also touch upon is that OS traditionally out of home, the billboards that you see traditionally has proven its might in terms of, you know, reach and impact, right, especially for brand recall and visibility brands, advertisers do tap into mass media in that sense. Now, the problem with any mass media is the measurability, though you are able to reach a really, really vast audience uh, very quickly. Uh, it's very hard to legitimately measure the impact or ROI uh, return on your ad spent um, in, in any of the mass media that you consider, right? Like whether it is newspapers or it is uh, radio or it is uh, billboards for that matter. So what is commonly uh, happening is and has been happening for decades now is that, you know, a, a, a common practice is to use a proxy to measure the effectiveness of the ROI of the medium. So for example, reach of a billboard uh, would be measured by say uh, calculating the number of vehicles that pass on a bridge regularly right and that too is measured like once in several years and it's hardly updated so there's a multiplier that you use blindly or reach of a newspaper is considered as a number of copies sold uh, in, in all these scenarios advertisers don't really have a way to measure effectively uh, you know what what exactly is the impact or the reach that they're leaving. now digital solves that issue Right, like there are established ways of measuring impact and attribution in the digital world. So, and hence digital out of home is a hybrid between the static out of home and the digital technology that's there, right? So now converting static billboards to digital, in my opinion, was only a matter of time. It is gaining significance now as technologies are being developed, people are becoming more aware. Advertisers are even willing to pay that premium to get inventory um, for digital out of home, right? And of course, it, it has been proven that digital out of home has a very unique advantage of um, looking at um, having reach of the mass media as well as a measurability aspect of the digital advertising that we have. You're on mute, Siddha. I'm sorry, sorry for that. Great, uh, thank you. Thank you, Rachita, for this. Okay, so now, uh, Rachita, how does agility and programmability, I know you touched upon this topic on your, uh, uh, just suggest about that. How does agility and programmability, programmability of DOH is changing the way out of home ads are produced and consumed? Right. Would you like to share uh, your opinion there? Sure, sure. So I think at Gojek last year, you know, like we had a first hand experience of dabbling into this, right? Like we launched one of the first transit programmatic digital billboard, which is the Go screen. So I would say this, let's watch that video first before we delve into how it is game changing and what programmable digital out of home means. Sure. Imagine an outdoor billboard with the power of digital ads. It's here and it's called Go screen, the smart bike billboard. A digital billboard that's moving with thousands of our Gojek drivers. You get the placement, drivers get the cash. Now, the smart part, you can target a specific location for time, morning rush, lunch, or late traffic hours, and in time. GoStreet also has technology that counts impressions of your app. So smart. That means you can track your app performance in real time. In short, you can make your ads more precise, dynamic, and affordable. So did you just hear mm -hmm. about the innovative Sorry. transit programmatic platform with actual impressions measurement in under a minute? Sure you did. Brought to you by Gojek, the Indonesian super app. Go to our website to know more about Gojek. I'm sorry, it was shared twice. I don't know. Imagine how an outdoor billboard. 
Okay, sure, no problem. I think there's some problem that the Zoom is doing something. I, I just anyway, everybody had a chance to at least uh, listen to or see some part of it. If not, uh, this is a widely available video on YouTube. So you can go ahead and find right. that. Right, Siddharth, you were saying right. something. Right. Yeah, no, nothing. So yeah, I was saying, I'm sorry, it, it, it took rounds to play it up. Sorry for that. Cool, great. Uh, uh, thanks, thanks, Sachita, for this uh, wonderful video. Now we understand what exactly is Go Screen and how is it changing the way advertisements will be consumed and then also uh, delivered. So let's 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 again talk about more about it. So how is what is the roles of edge computing in digital edge, Chetan? Can you can you under, help us understand that? Uh, sure, Siddharth. Uh, I'd like to thank you for that and probably. Uh... But before uh, going ahead with that, uh, I just want uh, you to take a look at this small video. I think yeah, there are a lot of it's coming up. this video is, as you could see, uh, though from the end user perspective, uh, it's, it's, a, it's a digital out of home in terms of uh, displaying a dynamic content, which is geo and as well as displaying a content based on certain specific uh, environmental status. In the specific case, when that particular flight comes over there, then you're actually putting a different kind of video which actually shows uh, the child showing it up. Okay. Though that's what uh, the end user consumes, right? Uh, this entire process is, is basically, if, if not very complex, at least a fairly complex uh, technology, which is carefully orchestrated, which includes your uh, sensor, which identifies the cloud, which includes your uh, geofencing environment to figure out where the flight is, and, and as well as connectivity to the back end to interrupt the current video and then display uh, uh, more or less like an, an augmented stuff in terms of it actually, the child actually shows directly at the flight, right? Like it's pretty much augmented that with the reality of the flight itself. So now if we look at the entire scenario, uh, there are a lot of uh, activity that happens here, a lot of processing that happens here. The sensor will have to detect and once it detects, it probably has to communicate. Then once it communicates, it probably has to talk to the screen and on the screen there has to be certain uh, compute element which is actually doing that entire job. So all these things, while the, the video itself might be grabbed from the cloud, but the rest everything, all the processing actually happens on the edge uh, in a distributed manner, right? So now uh, this is one of the examples and, and earlier we also saw uh, an example from uh, Rachita which showed about how you could have a, a, a bike with the digital screen and that can actually display the, the video based on a geofencing as well as collect impression about the, the viewers or the consumers, right? All those things does require uh, quite a bit of uh, computation, uh, quite a bit of uh, algorithms that are running on these devices and application running on these devices. And these are not run on centralized place. These are actually run on a distributed manner on these individual devices. And that's exactly uh, what edge computing is about, right? 
So now edge computing overall uh, from a terminology point of view is, is processing the data where the data is generated is actually helping uh, to come out with this new kind of experience for uh, digital out of home uh, advertisements. Awesome, thank you. Thank you, Chetan. Uh, I'll share the screen. Uh, can you allow me to? Yeah. Awesome. Okay, so this is for Rachita. Rachita, how does, uh, so when the idea of digital OH was conceptualized, what were you looking for and how did ICANN help you? Right. So when we started, uh, we honestly, we had no benchmarks. This was transit programmatic digital out of home was something that too in a programmatic fashion was happening for the, for the first time really, right? So it wasn't like we had any, any benchmark or any model that we could replicate, but we had some guiding principles that we, we had very clear in our heads. So essentially what those guiding principles were that it was based on what our objectives are and, you know, how would we like to achieve them? So one of the most important objectives for us was to help our driver partners, because that is something that Gojek really believes in, to drive social impact. So driver partners and increasing their earnings is also something that is um, that, that Gojek continuously works to improve upon. So that was one of our um, key objectives when we began with. And now for us to empower them with go screens, what we needed was we, we needed hardware that was lightweight, that was tough, that can withstand any hardware, uh, any weather conditions, any hard, rough conditions outdoors. Um, say that was theft or tamper proof and could run, run on really, really low power as well. So these were some sort of considerations that we ha had uh, keeping the drivers uh, in mind, right? And we also had the rider in mind such that the riding experience so the rider also is not disturbed just because we have a screen um, on it. So we were looking at how the shell could be, what the weight could be, what the position of the screen could be, and all of those things that also went into the hardware bit of it. Now, another key objective for us was to serve relevant ads programmatically. Now, what does programmatic mean? It, it means that looking at the context of wherever the device is, you serve a relevant piece of ad. And, and that relevance is the intelligence piece or the intelligent ad server that, ha that is residing on the Gojek cloud. So what we needed to understand um, to be able to serve relevant all ads was to understand the context or the surroundings better. For example, we would like to know what the location of uh, the screen is. Uh, we always needed to be connected to the screen. So internet was a must. We conceptualized the screen with custom made hardware and software to build our requirements. And like, as you can see, like these were not routine requirements and, and, and we couldn't find an out of the box solution available for us in the market that had all of these things ready that we could just plug in and start playing it. So now once we had the requirements ready, the question was how to govern uh, this setup, right? Like there were some things that we would be building the intelligence and all of that, but how do we govern? How do we do device management? How do we do frequent firmware upgrades? How do we know what the reliability is of the internet or of the GPS module or even of the device in the matter that whether it is on or off, or is it actually playing the ads the way we want to and so on and so forth. So that's where ICANN came in. We were doing uh, a lot of research and that's when ICANN, which was just a budding startup at that point in time, um, we, we got in touch with them and um, very soon they became our trusted partners for edge computing. And with ICANN, we were able to now solve for remote configuration, remote upgrades, screen mirroring and whatnot. So I think the, the initial pitches that and the initial discussions that we had with both um, Siddharth and Chetan led us to believe that, you know, we could trust the technology that ICANN already had. And what really helped was that the fact that ICANN was so modular in nature that some of these custom features could be very easily and quickly built, uh, which, which would be very, very specific to the hardware that we were also working with. Awesome. Thank you. Thank you for your kind words, Rachita. Very helpful. Thank you. Uh, Chetan, let's peel the onion more. Uh, let's try to see what's the technology stack behind this, uh, different hardware, software elements, and how do we start? How, if, if anyone wants to start, how do they do that? Uh, sure. Uh, so now, now if you look at it, uh, as uh, we earlier uh, understood, right, like uh, these are essentially uh, some way of uh, creating an environment uh, which, can, which can play uh, ads and videos in a very flexible manner, right? And, and that's what, what we need. And apart from that, 
uh, collect a lot of information about uh, uh, the impressions of the ad being played and then people around and those kind of things. So, so if you try to analyze what it requires is on the device, uh, we actually end up uh, running a, a compact uh, uh, a device which attaches to the screen and, and sort of plays your video. Apart from that, does a lot of things in terms of uh, whatever additional activities you need to do, like ca catching the impressions or probably uh, downloading the videos or doing a geofencing and all these kind of things. So now these devices essentially uh, would be a recognized device as uh, we already know that. And apart from that, like these are uh, you know, fairly powerful device, uh, something which uh, not like your conventional, uh, more like a microcontroller kind of small device, but then like a device which can really perform a lot of this activity, uh, which has multiple interfaces like uh, wireless uh, uh, in terms of uh, 4G or 5G interface to pull in the data as well as uh, sort of uh, capability to do video analytics if required, uh, in which case you probably have a custom built uh, GPU or an FPGA. So essentially we are talking about uh, what we used to think of as a server 15, 20 years back, right? Uh, which would probably mount it on a rack would actually become a small compact uh, a system on chip or module on chip device, which you can attach to your screen and then uh, do a complete uh, programmable interface. That's what you see on the, on the hardware side uh, in terms of the components, right? Now, if you look at uh, on the software side, uh, at a high level, at the device, uh, uh, whatever is running on the device, you probably have your actual application, which, which runs your uh, advertisement and performs a lot of other things. And, and related to the application, you probably have device run clients and SDKs and whatever, data pipes and those kind of stuff. And then also the device would include uh, mostly the, the management component, uh, which helps you do the complete management of this fleet of devices. We are talking about uh, you know thousand devices, five thousand devices. Uh, if any of the device is not playing the ad, uh, it, it's not going to be a good experience. Two things will happen. One is you're losing revenue because it's not playing ad, and second thing is it's a bad experience uh, for the consumers also because they see a blank screen. So in which case you need to have certain management component of the device to monitor these kind of uh, failures, right? On a centralized location, uh, what we spoke about is the device location here. In centralized location, you probably have uh, an overall orchestration system, which will help you manage this fleet of uh, 5,000, 10,000 devices in terms of identifying uh, what ads to be played, identifying what is a geofencing location for a specific kind of ad, uh, doing a configuration management on these devices, changing configurations based on certain abilities or certain functionalities you want to enable or disable. Uh, so, and again, you know, uh, based on the kind of uh, OOH functionalities we are talking about, uh, it can actually maybe, if, if these particular devices can provide uh, an augmented reality service, you'll probably have uh, video analytics uh, software running on the devices. You'll probably have uh, uh, the, the computer vision and those kind of algorithms running on the devices. Uh, when you're running those kind of things, ability to push your uh, models, if, if you're having a machine learning model on the device, ability to monitor these algorithms that are running, all those things is what you probably need to have in a centralized location uh, to manage this uh, fleet of large number of devices. Uh, in fact, uh, what I would say is when you're playing an ad on these devices, uh, two things will happen. One is we are talking about uh, devices in thousand numbers, not devices in terms of 10, 50. And each of these devices, as I mentioned, are quite powerful, right? Uh, whatever you could think of as a server 15 years back are actually these mobile devices in transit now, right? I mean, moving across everywhere. Now that means it's gonna have uh, an operating system. It's gonna have multiple processes running there. Now managing this fleet of complex, I mean, large number of devices and as well as complex devices. That's what makes uh, the system a little bit complex and, and you need to have a, a proper orchestration system at a centralized place to make sure you can run a business critical applications like digital OH on these devices. That's what uh, the software component on the system level or the centralized level, what you would see. So just to summarize, you have hardware, uh, which, is, which is predominantly uh, quite powerful uh, device uh, because it, it has to run a lot of 
um, machine learning algorithms or video analytics algorithms on the device. And you, on the hardware, you'll probably have runtime of the device and then a couple of operating systems, those kind of things. And then on the, from the software point of view, you have the actual applications on the device and some management agent. And on the centralized location, you're gonna have a complete orchestration system. That's how your, the hardware and software stack looks like. Awesome, wonderful. Thank you, thank you, Chetan. Uh, cool, Rachita, back to you. So what are the challenges faced A, during deployment? So when we were starting the deployments of these Go screens, what were the challenges faced? And also post deployment, like during operations, what were these challenges? That's a really interesting question. And I think Chetan would also, uh, you know, jump in with a lot of uh, anecdotes from our experience. So yeah, there were, there were many challenges along the way, right? Like I was sharing earlier, like since this was not done earlier, we were also, you know, like we went through a lot of um, experiments, a lot of troubleshooting. And what was most, um, you know, most critical in this part was that, you know, all of us, um, it was a large team uh, and we were working across four time zones, right? And all these devices were in Jakarta. Everybody else was, uh, you know, in different locations. So troubleshooting remotely uh, and that too on software and hardware, both that were new, like, super custom built they've never been even put together like that whole ecosystem also needs to come together for this to work there were many many challenges along the way right? like for example during our initial days like early pilots the first few devices that we put on the road uh, there were very frequent failures like for example the location uh, that we receive is incorrect or um, we would lose internet connectivity or the internet speed in our opinion would be really less but when we check on um, the provider side, they feel that, you know, the internet speed is sort of okay. Um, then we would lose, um, you know, we would lose power. So the battery would go down, apps would crash and whatnot. And I think Chetan will also sort of, you know, echo this sentiment. So all these issues were um, very hard to solve, given that all of us were working remotely because of COVID and also that, you know, the devices were there. And what, what, what was also another concern was that, you know, we had to we had to, because these devices were mounted on bikes and bikes were with drivers who used to move around, uh, every time we needed to do some sort of troubleshooting, we had to retract the devices. That means that the driver needs to come back to our center for that, right? And that, that's not a very good experience for the driver, which was also one of a big concerns for us. So we were constantly working towards reducing that friction and seeing what can we do on the road itself, like, you know, or over the air, right? Like, so OTA upgrades were something that was like super, super key to us. And I think ICANN contributed a lot um, in that. I think majority of what we've done in that in that area is um, can be sort of attributed to, to ICANN. And also other things, right? like the hardware was one, the other end was we, we had to do very frequent uh, upgrade to firmware as well, right? Like there was, I mean, and whether it was software, which is Gojek software or Icon or, you know, like our other partners, we faced issues like, you know, files were very heavy. So updates took longer to download and then to install as well, right? And then we had some devices failing in between. How do we reboot that? Like, how do we start from the time that it had failed and not go through that whole process again? Um, I mean, yeah, I think even for Icon, I would think that, you know, it was, it, it, it must be a special project in the sense that you know there were a lot of capabilities that were built only for go screen and there were built such that it can be sort of used only on 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 this hardware like for example um the tamper proof uh, sensor that we had and we had a bunch of other sensors that we controlled remotely and which is very specific to go screen so that's on the deployment and in the early days you know where we had to push out upgrades just to make sure that you know the device actually works um in the first place like you know works according to the way we want it to work now on the op side or was also it was very hard to find engineers on ground and that too during covid and we we required what did we require as expertise so we required hardware engineers who knew automobiles who knew screens who knew network who knew data so there was no one size fit all jd uh, there was no jd also for this role right? like so what we did was that we improvised on the go so Chetan and Icon team along with Gojek engineers, we had on ground ops team. All of us would huddle every single day on a Zoom call and which lasted for a full day, right? Like we would start in the morning at 8 a.m. and it would last sometimes till midnight, even longer so that all of us could join in like, you know, and drop off and troubleshoot and fix issues. 
and with time i'm really glad to say that you know having worked very closely with icon and all our other partners we were able to fix all these issues right like today that that product is launched it's in the market um we have close to 1000 devices on the road in jakarta um, but during this process like it was stuff right like war rooms were set up very frequently very frequent remote trouble shooting station was set up which is i think that that setup is still on today as well right like where we go ahead and anybody can go and troubleshoot um a device it's it's an always on uh, remote setup that's there so yeah i think it was an interesting experience given that you know the entire team across all uh, four time zones were working crazy hours on weekdays weekends holidays and i also remember a time you know when whatsapp and slack would be flooded with sos messages that you know something is failing or we we not connected to the internet we don't know where this device is uh, bluetooth is not working a bunch of other things not working and we actually didn't know how to solve it because it was very hard to even find out what the issue is at what time is it occurring and how can we solve for it right so the solving part of it was much later into the funnel the first the hard part was actually finding out uh, what our issues are and that's where um i can't really help us right? like setting up alerts uh, setting up uh, those timeline charts so that we could figure out what these failures are where are we breaching sls and what our sls could be right like benchmarking for sls also was an exercise that we could undertake uh, given the data that i can was able to collect on the device remotely for us thank you thank you ritika again i'm guessing if it would be couple of devices this would be easy but since we are talking about scale uh, this is a massive thing and and when we when we talk scale right we need to talk about we need to essentially take care of many many things as the sla is what you spoke about keeps into consideration too much so thank you cool again uh, back to chetan chetan uh, what about security and management of the digital oh devices and applications how do we handle this I know that I spoke about it, but yeah, maybe your input would help. Sure, sure, Sudhat. I think yeah, uh, maybe uh, more or less like uh, what Rachita pointed out, right? Uh, the one of the biggest challenge uh, was basically to have a uh, a very reliable and easy to use, but still secure remote access, right? You no, know? uh, because as Rachita mentioned, like I mean, these devices are actually on the road, and then. Uh, it's not going to be easy to pull the driver back every time when there is a problem, but can we really fix the problem uh, on the road, right? With the drivers running the devices, therefore, like you need to have a uh, pretty, pretty uh, uh, reliable uh, yet secure connection to the device. That's something which which becomes very critical uh, when we are talking about these kind of uh, remote devices. In, in general, any edge computing device, one of the problem basically is the device becomes more powerful, right? I think I, I told you one thing in terms of These are the same devices which were like mounted on the rack some 15, 20 years back. Quite powerful device, and now you're getting it on the, on your pocket or getting it on on a transit uh, OH device. That means uh, it opens up a lot of uh, possibility for somebody to hack into the system, right? Increases more attack surfaces. Potentially, uh, any anyone can can gain, gain access to one device, and once they gain access to one device. They're probably able to gain access to all the devices and start uh, displaying some spurious message on these devices. So it becomes very critical to make sure we we create a, uh, a very secure system, but still simple and flexible enough such that day-to-day -day operations are not sort of compromised, right? And and also we spoke about operational challenges, uh, which uh, Mr. mentioned in terms of uh, you know. <laughs> While while you could somehow manage to get the driver back onto the bay to fix certain problem on these devices, but at that time you should probably have your uh, the application team should probably have your uh, the the automobile team should probably have your hardware team. All of them sitting together, making sure come to the bay and fix the problem itself could be a big issue. Now, can we create an environment wherein uh, you could probably collect a lot of telemetry data from the device and then identify? Probable failures are, are, are at least point out the probable failure location and help troubleshoot this problem remotely with all the three team members joining into a call and then and then debugging the problem. Right, uh, that's that's during the development phase. Even subsequently, when when you start deploying it, when you start doing it in a day to day operation, these problems are not going to stop. Right. So now, can we have a, a system wherein the troubleshooting and and management can be done on this remote devices? Uh, flawlessly uh, and uh, in a secure manner uh, over a fleet of devices that's that's the 
operational challenges which people will face, both in terms of security, making sure things are secure. And second thing is in terms of management and control and scale of operations. These things make uh, your overall uh, operations quite complex. And, and then how do you make a system? Uh, I was talking to you in terms of uh, there is a centralized system where it, it provides a, an overall access to the uh, all your fleet of devices. Can we create right kind of dashboards? Can we create right kind of alerts? Uh, can we analyze right kind of events to make sure your day-to-day -day operations are simpler so that you know your operation costs are reduced, but still have highest availability of these devices to display the audios, display the video. That's where uh, the, both the operations and security becomes a fairly important topic to be considered. Good, good, good insights. Thanks, thanks, Nathan. I think we covered uh, most of the digital OH aspect with respect to hardware, software, the various operation challenges. Now, uh, uh, the next question would be, how do you see the digital OH uh, and predominantly the programmatic OH grow and expand in India and across the globe? Like, uh, what trends are you seeing and uh, uh, what people, uh, what, what would be the ROI for the people? Uh, maybe this, uh, let, let's start with Achita Vasis. Sure. So I think it's it's going to be one of the most interesting spaces to look out for uh, in 2021 and going forward. One is that the world is recovering from the COVID scare. Right? Like most of last year, people were indoors and it was not a really great year for um, any out of home media, right? Like whether traditional or out of home um, uh, digital. Uh, but people are now starting to move back, um, you know, back on the streets. So I think what is the kind of trends that we are seeing globally is um, the seamless interaction between, uh, you know, online to offline uh, marketing between uh, DOH and also personal media. So what is what is emerging is a concept known as hybrid or cohort targeting, right? Like what we know, we know two things today. We know um, mass targeting, which is what our mass media does that, you know, you have one message for everyone or, you know, um, personal messages, which is what the kind of ads that you see on your phone or on your laptop, which is personalized for you based on your interest, right? What, what The trend which is emerging is something known as a cohort targeting or a hybrid targeting, right? What it means is that when you do an out of home ad, can you show an ad which is relevant to a cohort of people who are actually going to see that ad? Uh, and that co as the cohort keeps evolving, can you change your ads or change your messaging accordingly? Right. So like, look at um, Times Square in New York, right? Like there are billboards everywhere um, and like really bright. And that has been happening since decades, right? It's one of the brightest lit uh, places in the world. Uh, but even then there, there's no targeting, right? Like nobody's targeting you. It's it's just there. And then the beauty of it is that because it is it is so large and, you know, it's, it's very hard to miss, that's where you get your brand recall. When it's more like personal branding, stores have their own branding in that sense, right? Uh, but you look at other billboards anywhere else, um, you don't get that sort of appeal, right? Like, for example, sometimes you develop that kind of banner blindness, even for your out of home media, because you pass by that route every day and you see the same ad and, and it stays there for months, uh, you know, if not, if not more. So now think about it this way that, you know, you're going to office, there's a huge billboard just outside your house and it keeps changing uh, based on the kind of, you know, int your interest keeps evolving the cohort around you keeps evolving and that way you see that happening so what that does is that, that sort of you know sort of marries your personal um personal choices personal behaviors to that cohort around you and then shows an ad which is relevant to a group of people that are not necessarily to one person right it's think of it like a phone for a lot of people so that that that's the kind of trend which is emerging now but what we need to be cautious about is user privacy, uh, safely sharing data practices. These are some of the things that, you know, that are, that are also going to kick in when you talk about these things, right? Like how, how okay are users going to be? Like, are they going to freak out seeing an ad which is, you know, super relevant to them on, on a billboard? Like, is that something that the, 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 uh, the mass is ready for? Uh, I mean, I don't know. That is just something that we'll have to see. But these are some trends that are evolving globally. Everywhere people are, you know, like the technologies are evolving such that all these things happen in a very safe and a user-friendly manner. Chetan, your views. Uh, yes, thanks. I think, uh, you know, Rachita uh, mostly covered most of it. So yeah. that's the advantage of talking 
Second, uh, but I think, yeah, in terms of technology trend, I think she covered uh, pretty much uh, most relevant in terms of how, how do we need to evolve the technology to really get a cohort-based uh, uh, advertisement rather than, you know, personalized versus uh, group. I think that makes a lot of sense, right? So in, in, in terms of uh, uh, just continuing with what Rachita mentioned, I think one of the things which, which I strongly believe is like, we are a mobile-first society, right, in terms of... Uh, so we do see people, uh, I mean, in fact, actually, I, I would say realizing that we are mobile first society really happened in the current pandemic year, wherein like we were tied, we, we were not allowed to move out. That's when people felt that, okay, I mean, earlier that luxury was, we didn't even know that it was a luxury. We thought that that's obvious. Now we know it's a luxury that we can move out. And that way we continue to be mobile first people, uh, society. So in which case people will be empowered with their powerful mobile devices go out and make purchasing decision on the move. That's, that's probably going to happen more and more. And, and I personally felt, uh, rather I personally realized that more because of not availability, not availability of those things during the pandemic time. So keeping that in mind, uh, I definitely feel OH is something which will continue to stay irrespective of your whatever uh, personalized ad, what you see on your mobile phones and laptops, right? Even including TVs. So now keeping that in mind, uh, from the technology perspective, uh, I, I think uh, the, the advent of 5G or at least the deployment of 5G plus edge computing wherein ability to run applications in a distributed manner and then manage this application in a distributed manager, distributed manner is going to fuel more and more digitization and uh, our out of home advertisement is, is not going to be any exception for that. Uh, the tech enable we will, will continue uh, and uh, really the, the DOOH market has a capacity to accept more, right? So what we're talking about right now was just a simple screen, uh, a digital screen. And subsequently we talked about collecting the impressions. Subsequently we talked about cohort based advertisement. If you want to do all those things, uh, there's a need in the digital OH market to accept this newer technology. That, that's something which is going to happen. So technology will probably marry with the needs in the market. And, and subsequently, uh, based on a couple of reports I've seen, and as well as my own assessment, uh, digital OH is something which is going to grow with the CAGR of 10 to 13 percent, uh, which will continue to grow. And uh, I strongly feel 2021 will, will, will actually see a bigger growth than the average 10 to 13 percent. The reason being, uh, it's a time where uh, we're actually coming out. Uh, people are actually moving out of their homes, getting onto the, uh, the, the outside world. And the technology is being enabled. Uh, so we saw a, a one year of lull where things didn't happen. All of a sudden you have so much of technology and it's like you have people coming out and you really see a big boost uh, in digital OH in 2021. Uh, and subsequently it might stabilize anywhere between 10 to 30% CAGR. And uh, I strongly feel by end of 2021, like, from the overall market perspective, not in terms of space, not in terms of number of ads played, but from the market perspective, where digital OH will probably take up around 25% of the global uh, OH uh, spending. That's what I strongly feel. Absolutely. Absolutely. Thanks. Thanks, uh, Chetan and Racheta, both for sharing your views around digital OH, edge computing, the challenges. The how to start with that and all of them. Thank you very much. Now I would like to take the audience through what exactly is ICON, how we help edge computing infrastructure companies to work alone. Uh, Chetan, maybe I'll, I'll share because I might have to share the demo as well. So I'll, I'll start. I hope you guys can see my screen. Yep. Don't play. Great. Uh, uh, thanks, guys. Uh, so a lot being talked, spoken about Icon by Rachata and Chetan both, but I'll, I'll summarize what exactly we do and how do we help an edge enterprises companies to 
completely manage their devices. So Icon is a software solution, completely software solution to monitor, manage, securely access and upgrade an array of remotely deployed devices and applications across edge computing horizon. So if you, so this the, the, this particular example is prominently what the, the images which you are seeing is prominently in the space of where Android devices are used and we are using we we doing it for either digital OH or interactive kiosk or maybe smart retail. So where all there's a human interaction happening. So uh, uh, and these are some of the examples where edge computing uh, is used. So interactive kiosk, as I said, S signage, uh, which is, I spoke more about it, smart retail, these vending machines which are there. You have smartphones or point of sales machines, right? And that's where all uh, these all devices or the solutions can be managed through item where we help them to completely access and update the devices. Now, if you look around all these uh, use cases, what we spoke about in uh, the last thing, what is unique about these use cases, right? And each of them would be running on a different hardware and the application would be different. So a digital signage would be running a programmatic, programmatic uh, where targeted ads, which, which could be one of the application based on the audience, based on the, the, the uh, the place where it is deployed, what edge it should play, that would be one of the application. In case of POS, it will be billing applications which would be deployed on these devices. But what is common across all these use cases is like once deployed on field or given to a person for remote, one has to be each of these use cases has to make sure privacy and security of the device and the applications deployed on them. You must be able to remotely connect to these devices. You must be able to monitor devices, applications peripherals attached to these devices as well, and upgrades to a proper over their upgrades and deployments, new deployments on these devices. These are what is common across all these use cases which I mentioned about. And that's where ICON helps in solving all of that. Now, how do we do this? If you see this, right, this is a classic interactive care. So you could say this could be some digital signage devices that are very similar to what being installed in Go screen set. Right? So uh, this is uh, somewhere where uh, people can interact with this, buy it as, as well. So what all elements are being attached to a digital screen like this, right? You could see there's a camera always to read the profile or to know the persona of the customer or the person who is watching either the ad or is interacting with this device. There's a touch screen, there's a printer to give you a receipt, a connectivity module is there, a processor is there, and a card reader, maybe if you are doing some transactions to the device as well. Now, a, a, a single, a single either a signage board or a kiosk is handling all these peripherals along with it. How do you manage all of them from the cloud? Anyone going down or anyone not working properly is essentially going to bring down your application completely. So what we do at Icon is when we install our agents on these processing devices. Now, these processing devices could be anything running Linux or Android as of now. And these are completely software agents where these agents help us to collect data and help us to control each and every aspect of these edge device from the cloud. I'll, I'll uh, very quickly show you how we do that as well. Now, what exactly uh, the features you get after installing this agent? So you can do a complete re remote app deployments, either it could be Android app APKs or it could be your native package application deployment. You could do a monitoring of devices, applications, peripheral control, as I said, right? You need to uh, turn on off the screens. You need to uh, reboot the Wi-Fi module. You need to restart the Bluetooth devices attached to it. You need to uh, turn uh, off the camera itself or maybe on it based on the requirement which is from the cloud is what you can do, peripheral control. You can do a remote secure access, create reports at the end of the day, how many people watched it, how many, uh, uh, the time the device was up and all of them, right? I'll very quickly take you to, you can definitely try it out from our experience site, which is a completely self-help site. Uh, I'll take you through the demo of the system as well, what exactly it has to I hope you can see my screen. Yeah, that's how it. So the agents are right now deployed in almost 34 sites and 23 are up right now, 11 are down. The customers can create their profiles and these are the applications, the specific applications these devices, they, these edge devices would be running. As I said, it, if it's an interactive chaos, the, the application could be, if, if it's selling something, if it's a mobile post, the billing application. So if it's a signage board, the advertisement display applications could be here. Going inside the device, you could see, I can see all the devices which are up. The devices which are up, I can remotely connect, uh, as we spoke about, right? Remote connectivity to these devices was very, very critical while debugging issues. And you can do 
a remote connectivity with a single click right here. Got it. And this is an Android device. I will go inside the device. You can open device ports. If there are specific ports where it is executing something, you can open. If there's a camera attached to this device port, definitely you can uh, uh, open the camera port. It might be the camera might be sending the feed to our TSP port. You can open those device ports as well. You can execute commands, which is now, this is very, very important, right? Many times you want to execute commands to hundreds and thousands of these deployed devices, or you want to give an instruction to these devices to do something. You can do it, just execute any command or just configure at any command and you are good to go. So I want the list of all the install packages here. Just execute it and that's it. You have the install packages in all these, at least in this device and you can do it for other devices as well. Makes sense, right? Uh, yeah, there, there's one another very important and in fact a very unique feature which we have bought it is you can do a complete screen mirroring. You can control the screens from the cloud as well. I'm just going to show you how we do it. Uh, so you need to just open port 5555 here where it's excluding the screen. I'm just popping it up. Share the whole screen. Okay. Can you see the Android scheme coming up? Is it visible? No, it's not. Okay. Can you just share the entire screen? It's different. Yeah, I hope. Is it visible now? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. you guys can see, right? I can access the screen of the. Android device, which was remotely there, I can in fact control it as well. I can open the gallery, so that's nothing. Uh, that's that's the that's the strong thing which you are coming, which we are coming up with. So now, any screens are deployed anywhere, you have a complete access and control of these screens from anywhere, right? Uh, that's one thing. You can have a complete uptime. When was the device up, down? Why was it down? What were the network problems? As what Rachita mentioned, right? These were critical issues. So. You could see here, right? The device on, uh, let me take you through again. So on 3rd of uh, January, the device, February, the device went down between 12 a.m. to 1 a.m. It was only up 38% time. What exactly was the reason for it? You could find it out here. So it's a system problem. There was a CPU load was quite high and that's that made the device unreachable from the cloud. Now you know the problem and you can definitely remotely fix that. Up. We talk about applications, how your applications are performing. And the, as I said, right, these could be any applications deployed. So you have the applications which are like, uh, right now, uh, these are the processor applications which are monitored. I can have a clear visibility of each and every application, how the CPU, how's the network of this application, uh, the data consumption, each and every part of it. Right. Uh, then you can do a complete over there upgrades of these devices over there upgrades with respects to specific configurations, specific applications, or maybe script file you want to go ahead and deploy to these devices. You can do each and everything of it. And we'll, after at the end of the day, we'll have a clear visibility of how many devices got upgraded. Why are they not? Why have they not been upgraded? What exactly failed in all these devices? I just want to take you to one of this deployment, which I did recently. Yeah. So you could see here, right? Uh, there were tw total 24 devices which uh, got deployed with one of the uh, test file. And then it is still in the process of deployment because four devices are still down, their network down, so it's not able to. So out of this 24, 17 got successful, one is failure and two skipped because maybe the, the, the version, the, the deployment version was already there on these devices. Then you have a complete feature of events, right? Events and notifications coming up from these edge devices and all from the peripherals as well. So what exactly is happening on these devices? How are they behaving on these events? 
will come up to your devices. Then we have Netto reports here. So you could say you can create reports at the end of the day by how the devices are behaving. Maybe uh, uh, when were they up in last one day, how many devices were up to a profile, uh, how many, what's the network speed of these devices, a complete report can be created and sent to the higher management for review purpose. So I want a CPU load time and then maybe a device uptime. So yeah, you could see here, there's one device on this thing, which is CPU load. So essentially all the devices which are up or there in this particular profile, you have a complete report from past one day, right? Uh, that's it. Uh, I think I've covered most of the features which are required. Yeah, as one more thing, right? As I mentioned, you can deploy uh, or upgrade your application. So now if these are Android devices, you can deploy APKs as well or upgrade your existing APKs as well to these Android devices, which I deployed remotely. Great. Uh, I think uh, that's it. From the uh, demo side now i'll i'll be happy to take up audience questions uh, okay with you rachita chetan yeah, we'll yes. for another meeting but probably we can take one question sure uh, much here yeah maybe yes so uh, uh, when we say uh, programmatic advertising how is the request from the edge device actually sent to programmatic ad buying platforms like google or media map so uh, how does this happen <clears throat> this happened like from <clears throat> from the cloud how the how do these media platforms come to know about uh, the programmatic ads which has to be played okay so if you are aware about the mobile advertising ecosystem right like on your app um, you would have certain slots that are created for ads by the publisher and that whenever that uh, that screen is rendered an ad request is fired which goes up to the ad server which decides which is the best demand that can be served and that demand can be sourced by the demand can be sourced from multiple demand pools right like could be ttd dv360 could be your own demand pool as well so that is the same ecosystem that is followed by go screen as well so you can think of it as a phone like a larger phone that um, you know that has an app on it it has an ad app on it and it fires up an ad request to our ad server so currently we don't source external demand we source demand internally so it it it, it pings our ad server the ad server looks at the demand pool and serves the most relevant ad uh, for for that particular time so we look at location targeting so geofencing that um, chetan was talking about so in in jakarta we have a concept of quotas and kachamatans so it's more like districts and areas um, so you could do a kachamatan level geofencing targeting on our app currently and we also do day parting which is you can choose the hour of the day and day of the week that is a level of granularity that you can choose as an advertiser and keeping those two um, levers in mind we go ahead and serve the most relevant ad for that um, surrounding for that screen awesome awesome great uh, thanks i think uh, since you have a meeting you may leave thank you very much rachita uh, uh, for your time and uh, the great insights that you have given us <clears throat> i will take the another question for chetan maybe yeah thanks thanks then thanks to that and thank you audience i think this was great and like i mentioned before um, i can continue to be one of our most trusted partners it's always a pleasure to have this conversation awesome. thank you very much all the best guys take care bye bye, -bye. good Chetan, uh, so what about low ed, low budget edge devices such as Raspi or ARM? So since there are this, these are resource constraint devices, uh, does running AIML models in security can be a strenuous fight? Can be. Uh, yeah, I would not treat at least Raspberry Pi as a low power device. You know. Uh, yeah. If, if you look at Raspberry Pi Four, uh, it, it's basically a, a quad core system uh, running at one point five gigahertz. Uh, with anywhere between two to eight GB of RAM, which is a very powerful device. And on this device, you can definitely run um, basic ML algorithms. Uh, so based on the kind of, uh, I mean, based on the configuration, you can also run a, a, a deep neural network algorithms as well on, on a uh, four core uh, 1.5 gigahertz CPU. That, that's pretty powerful actually. Now, if you're, if you're talking about Raspberry Pi Zero, Raspberry Pi One, may, maybe we have a thing through in terms of this thing, right? And, and another important thing is uh, uh, we actually get an extension for Raspberry Pi uh, 
these extensions are comes with the GPU also. You can get a GPU extension. So get a Raspberry Pi, plug in a GPU extension, uh, do your uh, compute, uh, or rather in terms of a lot of uh, floating point operations on these GPUs, that then we probably uh, done, done most of the stuff pretty easily. So Raspberry Pi definitely, which is anyway ARM based system, is definitely not a, a powerful, uh, not a low power device at all. Uh, there, there are many other low power devices, uh, much, much worse than Raspberry Pi. And, and you could actually run uh, your machine learning algorithms even on those devices. Uh, it, it's a model which you will actually end up running. Uh, people call what is called as a, uh, a federated model, wherein you have a, a deep learning algorithms running in the cloud and inference algorithm with the, with the lower level uh, neural network layers or, or lower level layers of your, of your uh, machine learning algorithm being running on the edge. It's more like, you know, uh, think of it like uh, if you're running a video analytics application on these uh, low power devices, uh, the actual model creation can hap actually happen on the cloud, right? And then these models can be pushed onto the devices and then you run the algorithms based on this particular model. So if you look at it in terms of neural networks, basically the, the weights are something which are adjusted on the cloud and you just push the weight onto the device, weight on the device, and then they, you, you run a basic algorithm there to do the inference. So we're talking about video analytics to identify if there is a mob or to identify uh, if somebody is coming with, without a mask or not. All those things can actually be done on the Raspberry Pi kind of device pretty easily. Yeah, true. True that. Cool. Uh, I think we are done with most of the questions. Uh, uh, that's it. Uh, um, thank you. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Chetan, for uh, at least sharing your views. And it was quite, quite insightful. Thank you, everyone, for joining the session. Uh, I'll definitely share the recorded session with you, uh, along with the presentations which you presented. Uh, do write to us if you if you uh, have any interest in at least trying out Icon or try it out at experience.icon.io as well. Uh, I'll, I'll definitely share the link across the board. Cool. Thank sure. you. Uh, thanks. Uh, thanks, Siddharth, and thanks, uh, all the audience. Thank you.